Welcome to another episode of This Too Shall Suck podcast, where we talk about the real of grief, the whole grief, and nothing but the grief. I am your host, Lauren Denise, and I'm so, so happy to have you here. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'm super thankful for you. If you're listening again, welcome back. And thank you so much for continuing to join me on this journey. On today's episode, we're going to be diving into this whole COVID-19, let me say coronavirus. Let me tell y'all, my friend be trying to play me because he said, I think I'm better than everyone else because I say because I said COVID-19. So I told him, I was like, yeah, just call me Dr. Lauren. That's fine. <laughs> I feel. He said, I feel like I'm above everyone because I say COVID-19, not coronavirus. Whatever. As I said, <laughs> COVID-19 and this grief that you're feeling around it. And, and you may be like, Lauren, I don't feel any grief around COVID-19. Like I'm straight. I'm good. But we're going to dive into what you may be feeling and why it may be grief. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Y'all know why we here to talk about all things grief. And I'm super excited because today I have a special guest coming in. He is a licensed professional counselor. And so we're just going to talk about the grief surrounding this whole situation. And he's going to give us some tips of how to work around it. So I'm super just thankful that he's here and, you know, here to help us all because right now we're just in a really weird place. And it's 2020 is a fool. She's a fool. And I keep calling her she. Maybe I'll say he's a fool. Because see, y'all dudes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 2020 is acting a whole fool. And this whole COVID thing is just, it's just weird because we're such in a place of the unknown. And I think that's why everyone is, is just, you, you don't know if you're If it's safe to go outside or if we can wear a mask or if it's not good to wear a mask or if your throat is itching, you got it. Like, we're just, gosh, it's just so much surrounding it that I just know that people don't know how to process and don't know what it is. And so that's really why I want to bring him on to kind of get his perspective as a licensed professional who can hopefully help navigate some of those feelings that we're all having. And that's why I said not just you not just meet like we're all having the same feelings they may not be the exact same but they're we're we're connected we're all connected in some type of way and the connection is the human connection of the unknown with this covid-19 situation so i wanted to share with you all my i guess experience that i've had thus far with it so and and it kind of goes back to i of course i tie everything back to grief and I found a new word today of what type of grief it is. And so I'll kind of explain that to you all in a second. But my experience with it is, of course, we (laughs) all know that the symptoms of it, we all know the symptoms are fever and sore throat and all these things. But in Georgia, if you live in Georgia and you know anything about this pollen, yo, I never had issues with pollen until last year. And I'm so irritated that I have (laughs) Like, I never was that person. I have a friend and I tell her, you need to live in a bubble because she is allergic to everything. But I never had that problem. So people be like, oh, my allergies flared up. I'm like, hmm, tuh. don't know what that's like. See, that's what I get. Making fun of people who have allergies. And now my little crazy self over here got allergies. Y'all, I walked outside one day and my chest immediately tightened up and my eyes started watering. I was like, um... Yeah, I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> I'm not supposed to be here. Uh, you know, you're not supposed to be here. And that's when I knew that allergies had taken over Lauren Denise's life. And so I immediately went to the store, got some Zyrtec, and we're in this thing. So we're good now. Now now that we know how to handle it, and yeah, we're good. But there was a point where I did, you know, went outside, went to the store, and my allergies started acting up. So that night, I was having itchy throat, and I... <laughs> was freaking myself out. I was literally taking my temperature every hour. You know, it just really put me in it like, do I have COVID? And I live with somebody. So I'm like, oh my gosh, like if I have it, am I going to give it to her? Is the dog going to get it? Like I just went to this whole place. So I tried to go to sleep that night. Ended up finally going to sleep. Y'all, I got woken up at 3.30 in the morning. I woke up out of my sleep, like almost hyperventilating. It was wild. And I'm like, Lauren, okay, calm down. I had to literally, I was having an anxiety attack. And I had to calm myself all the way down because when I when I woke up and I had that slight shortness of breath, I freaked out and I freaked myself even more. And I literally, I think I turned on some worship music. And at that moment, 
God was like, get your journal. I was like, I'm sorry. (laughs) It's like, get your journal and just write. And the beautiful thing about this whole situation with anxiety and the grief and the, the unknown around it is I feel like for me, and again, this is my experience, God is able to speak to me so much more clear when I had all these things going on. And now I don't. And he literally was like, just write. And I went back and looked at my journal the other day and it was on March 24th and it was at 3.30 in the morning. And what was birthed from that moment was this podcast. I literally started writing down all these topics on grief. I started researching, again, this is (laughs) 3.30 in the morning, researching different podcasts on grief and just was writing and was so inspired in that moment. And so it literally brought me from the anxiety that I was having back to a place of peace and calm. And I was able to finally go back to sleep after all that. And I'm just thankful for that moment that, you know, I feel like God took a a moment of panic and a moment of fear and a moment of unknown and brought me to a place to say, hey, I got you here. Here you go. I'm going to give you this gift. And so I think that's the beauty in it that it's, it's, it's such a weird feeling. And it's such a scary feeling sometimes because listen, I I know if you're listening, raise your hand. If you woken up in the morning and you start shaking your head, your throat start itching, you, you, yeah, Corona, is that you? Ro, ro. (laughs) Listen, we have all been doing it since this whole thing started because it's, there's information changing every single day. There's so much fake news, there's real news. You feel like our our leadership isn't isn't working and not only just the US, if you're listening overseas, thank you number one. Hey. Um but just everywhere, we just, you know, we just feel like we're not prepared and I think that's the biggest thing is we don't feel like we're prepared and when you don't feel like that, it makes you uneasy or people have been laid off and lost their jobs or people are at home by themselves having to deal with it or people who have, you know, mental um, illnesses, I guess is the word I'm saying, but, you know, have anxiety or have depression or have schizophrenia or have bipolarism, like all these things. Now you kind of feel like left alone. And then even the people, and I'm going to talk about this as well. Even the people who are in relationships are married, who are now in the house with their spouse or their significant other every single day, and and now you're starting to see things or things are starting to be revealed because when we're going and we have kids and you have all these things, you especially if you're married, like obviously you marry this person for whatever reason, but maybe, I don't know, maybe you're just seeing some things. And I'm going off of conversations that I've had with people who are married or who are in a relationship who are like, I, this is, I'm seeing things in my spouse that I just did not know or I knew and maybe I just didn't, you know, worry about it because- they were making up, you know, like making up for whatever it was by doing something else. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of that going on. So what I found out today is there's a word called anticipatory grief. And basically what that grief is, that feeling we get when we don't know what the future holds or when we're uncertain about what it is. And this typically happens, or I guess typically is triggered when you get maybe diagnosed with something. So if you hear that diagnosis of cancer or someone around you, like for me, when I heard that my um, dad got diagnosed and I shared with you guys, I, I kind of went to that place of like what happens, right? I was going through that anticipatory grief. And, and that's kind of the place that I think we're all in right now because we don't know what the future holds. We don't know, like we're trying to adjust to this new normal. And we're like, is this our new normal? Like what's going to happen? Like, do we have to wear masks all the time? Are kids going to be able to go back to school? Am I going to be able to, you know, do the normal things that I was able to do? Are we going to be able to have concerts again? Are we going to be able to do conferences again? Are we going to be able to hug again? Right? It's just so many crazy things because anticipatory grief is kind of knowing that something bad around you is happening, but you can't see it. And if you think about that, that's exactly what COVID is. It's a virus that you cannot see and you know that it's bad. You don't know how you, I don't want to say you don't know how bad it is because we know how bad it is, but we really don't know how bad it is, right? And so it's just this weird feeling of the unknown. And so I think we're all in the place of anticipatory grief and 
we just didn't want to recognize it. Or let me not say didn't want to, we just didn't know how to recognize it as grief. Of course, I knew how to recognize it because I have been through the grieving process. But for those people who haven't been through that process, they don't know, they, they have all these feelings and emotions and they don't know what it is. So like I said, I definitely am going to dive into that with our guest on the show here. And we're going to talk about all that and some more right after this break. Are you listening to my podcast right now and wondering, I wonder if I could start a podcast like Lauren did? Well, I'm here to tell you that you most definitely can. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. Number one, it's free. So no monthly subscriptions, no hidden fees. It's free 99. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. So no need to go out and buy hundreds of dollars equipment like I did. (laughs) You can do it straight from your phone or computer. And Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. So it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many, many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. And let's get back to the show. All right, you guys, we are back and I am super excited, like I said, to interview and bring on this next guest. He is actually, it's it's a funny story, funny story. So there's a Georgia State group and I asked people in the Georgia State group, is there a professional therapist or counselor that someone can refer me to? I would love to interview them on the podcast. So everyone starts tagging this guy. They're like, Justin, Justin, Justin. I'm like, all right, cool. So I send Justin a message. I'm like, yeah, I would love to interview on the podcast. Woo, woo. And what's funny is we talked and he's like, yeah, so I have a, <laughs> I have to tell you something. I'm like, what's going on, Justin? He's like, I, have, I went to Morehouse. I was like, wait, 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 what? So he went to Morehouse and he's like, yeah, you know, I was just at Georgia State. So everybody thought I was at Georgia State. I was like, but you in the group. So, I mean, but I know, listen, I know some of y'all on here who I really thought y'all went to Georgia State and y'all didn't. So, I mean, I ain't mad at all, but it was just so funny because everyone's like, Justin, Justin, Georgia State. And I'm like, yeah, Panthers, woo. And he's like, yeah, I went to, no, I went to Morehouse. I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) All right, that's cool. But I just wanted to read a quick bio so you all can get to know him. Justin the Bowles has always had an interest in the thoughts and minds of individuals and how those thoughts influence our actions, responses, and behavior. This interest started his senior year of high school after taking one psychology class and continued to grow as he got older. This led him to a break away from his passion of computer science to pursue a passion for learning people instead of machines. A graduate of Morehouse College in downtown Atlanta, he always he also has a strong love for the African-American community and its mental stability and health. After graduating college, he sought his graduate education and received a Master of Science in Psychology at Auburn University, Montgomery in Montgomery, Alabama. Since returning from graduate school, he has worked at various mental health agencies serving the community by doing both in-office and in-home sessions. He chose this path to ensure that he stayed close to his community in their element. He has worked multiple years at a mental health hospital, helping individuals recovering from both mental disabilities and substance addiction and abuse. He describes the hospital environment as a true test to determine if the counseling and mental health field is really for someone or not. After years of supervision, he received his LPC in the state of Georgia in 2016 and spent some time learning under others how to operate a private practice before finally opening his own in the summer of 2019. Since then, he has been continuing to serve his community both in their homes and in his office, offering counseling and therapy to men, women, children, and families with a strong devotion to the African Americans and minorities. He aims to help people learn to become the best versions of themselves by helping their minds help their behavior, which can impact their environment and community. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Justin to the show. I'm going to need you to introduce me more often. (laughs) Listen, I said, 
Oh, he important out here, y'all. I got somebody important on the show, y'all. Okay, I got somebody important out here. So, Justin, uh, you know, we learned a little bit about your background and how you got into it. And I think that's so awesome, you know, how you kind of got into it. So the first question I wanted to ask you, because I and maybe this was really for me and not for others. But if you can tell me the difference and tell the people the difference between a therapist, a counselor and a psychiatrist, because I think people sometimes get those confused or don't necessarily know like, oh, I'm just going to a counselor or a therapist. So I would love for you to kind of explain the difference, if there is any, between them. There is, there's practically no difference between a therapist and a counselor. It really just depends on what title you want to use. Uh, okay. I provide therapy. I provide counseling. Um, that's Those two run hand in hand. The, where the difference comes in is when you get into psychiatry. A psychiatrist, instead of going to graduate school, goes to medical school because a psychiatrist can prescribe medication. Mm, okay, I got you. Whereas yeah. counselors, therapists, and above those two, psychologists don't prescribe medication. Got you. Okay, so a, psych- psych- a therapist and a counselor are the same. A psychologist goes to school a little longer? Is that what that is? They definitely go to school longer. A psychologist has to, be, uh, has to get a doctorate. You have to have a PhD in order to be a psychologist. So, you know, I really wanted to bring you on to talk about this whole weird, unknown situation we're in called COVID-19 or coronavirus. It's bizarre. Um, I think people are feeling and experiencing so many different emotions right now. So is it fair to say that some of what they're feeling is grief or no? You can definitely apply grief, uh, a grief label to it. Oh, man. Um. Some people feel like some people definitely could start to show, start to feel as if they're experiencing the loss of their freedom. We see that with the protesters, whether we agree or disagree with them. Um, We start to see that where people can't go outside. You can't do all the things you want to do. Some people live such socially, such social lives that now they can't do that. And they feel like a part of them is kind of a part. They feel like a part of them has died. And so they're definitely experiencing a lot of grief out there, even if no one has physically passed in their family or, or you know, obviously themselves, they, they definitely would start to mimic that sort of emotion. Yeah, I believe it because I, I I definitely recognize some of the traits of grief, obviously going through it myself and even having conversations. And I know you and I had conversations about how, you know, so, kind of some of your friends and family have been calling you. What are some of and, and I'm not telling you to, you know, obviously tell their business, but what have you seen you know, really people's emotions? Does it change every day? Are they calling you like, I'm having anxiety. I've never had anxiety. Like, what have you, what have you seen that's changed in kind of your world since this whole thing has started? The number one question I get is, when is this going to end? Do, do you think, do you know when this is going to end? Or do you have any idea when this is going to end? I, I, don't, I don't have a clue when it's going to end. Um, I tell people you might just want to get used to this for a while and when it ends, be happy. But you might want to figure out how to make this work for you. Um, Most people call me of of varying ages, young and older, Mm. and just want ways on how to deal with their anxiety because they're at home a lot. Without getting too soapboxy, you know, America is very much a, we we are a distraction-based community. Like we're a very entire distraction-based nation. We like distracting ourselves. With something, if it's whether it's with work, whether it's with family, friends, whatever, you know, whatever your vice may be, it serves as a distraction from the stressors that we experience. So now people can't go to happy hour. Now people can't go and just hang out with their friends and have their kickbacks. Now people can't. Now that guy who maybe his home life isn't that great. He can't go to work and kind of get away from home. He's at home now. So mm. people are kind of forced to face a whole lot of things that they may not want to face at this moment. Yeah, yeah. I think that's that's an interesting point that you brought up and that we're a distraction society. I never I guess I never thought about it like that because we do. We just you're going, 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 going. And now we're stopped. And it's like mm, that's a surefire sign of grief when you're just going and then you stop and you feel like everything hits you all at once. So I think that's really an interesting name or interesting point. So what are, so let's dive a little bit into that. So what are some of the stressors, I guess, that people are facing now more that you've seen that maybe they didn't 
either face before or maybe they just didn't acknowledge them before? The biggest stressor. Um, the biggest stressor I definitely can see people facing is finances. I mean, def- you see people losing their jobs. Mm-hmm. So, you know, finances is definitely one stressor I'm seeing a lot of families and a lot of individuals have to deal with. Um, and then the second biggest stressor that everyone's dealing with, and I, I chuckle about it um, because it's one that most people can't really get away from at all, uh, is family. <laughs> for those with children, um, for those with children, be it their own, be it their siblings' children, you know, nieces and nephews, these kids are home day in, day out, and you can't really send them to many places um, because it's one thing you know, kids are little germ factories. You know, kids don't understand how to calm their minds the same way adults do. Whatever sort of routine you had for your children when they were in school, that's gone now. Mm. And you're trying to create new routines while also trying to figure it out for yourself. I mean, this isn't easy for adults either. So yeah. having that constant interaction with your kids and with family members, that's that's tough. You know? Um, that, that can get a little, that can get a little difficult sometimes. And I mean, everyone needs their time. Yeah. And when you can't get that time, little by little, something called resentment starts to kind of creep in. And that, uh, for those, for those that don't know about resentment, it's just, just the feeling of, um, a, a, it starts as a small dislike to maybe one little behavior. Mm-hmm. Ladies, perhaps you don't like that. Perhaps you're, you're living with your significant other and maybe he's one of those that either doesn't take care of the kitchen as much or even something minor as the, the toilet seat, you know, the, the, the stereotypical one. You know, you used to see it maybe once a day. Now you're seeing it three, four times a day. Right, right. And that little, that little annoyance grows and becomes stressful over time. So yeah. everything's getting to everybody a lot more. Mm-hmm. because we're forced to just kind of look at it a lot more than usual. You know what I mean? I absolutely agree. So in those situations, you, you made a good point about everyone needing their time. Cause I'm a big person on having decompressed time from whatever it is, whether that's work, whether that's, you know, your kids or whatever. And again, I don't have a husband or kids, so I can't speak to that. But what I can speak to is Lauren needing decompress time from whatever it is that I'm doing. So in these moments like this, when we're quarantined in the house or even, you know, some of these states are opening. Georgia is attempting to do whatever it's trying to do. Um, how do you create? Do you just how do you create that space in that time? Do you have a conversation with whoever you're with? Like, I need I need a little bit of time or like, how does that work? How do you suggest people kind of create that space for themselves to, to get a mental break during this time? Well, it definitely helps if you have a it helps if you have a partner or you have, you know, family members there. Who you can communicate with. Mm-hmm. That, that's first and foremost. Um, you definitely want to be with someone that you can actually communicate that to. Hey, give me a minute. You know, or do you mind, you know, hey, can I just get a little bit of time? You know, we'll talk a little later. I'm going to just go do this for a little while. You know, we'll wrap later on or however you have to ask for it. Um, but I recommend everybody get it. Yeah. Everybody get it. Um, in my case, uh, in my case, Look, my kids have their own room. Uh, my wife has the house, and I have the basement. <laughs> I know if I ever need to get away, I can just go down an extra flight of stairs, and I'm probably going to have some me time. Yeah, so I think the biggest thing is understanding is, is what I'm hearing, just having some understanding and giving each other a little bit of grace. And definitely have some understanding, but also have some awareness. Um, we're, in some very diff- we're in some very strange times right now. Yeah, yeah. So... Like we said before, everyone's anxiety is kind of going in waves. So things that things that may be minor are going to irritate somebody and things that may not be minor, you know what I mean, are going to seem even more over the top. So we really have to kind of just be understanding about the whole situations right now. No one's necessarily the happiest in the midst of this. If you got to go sit in the car. And just, you know, listen to listen to some music. Please don't turn it on. But um, just listen to some music, you know. So I'm going to kind of stay on this couple's route because I have some questions about, you know, my my single folks. I'm coming for y'all singles. We out there. I got y'all. But 
Um, you know, I've, I've had conversations with some people and they have been struggling, you know, in their marriage, in their relationship, because they feel like I have, I don't know this person anymore. Or like you said, maybe things that they haven't, or they, that were small, but they kind of made up for it in other ways. And they're like, you know, I just, this, this person is not who I thought they were. And I don't know who they are. Like, how do you suggest them kind of getting back into that space of remembering why they decided to choose this person? Like, that's my person in life. Like, how do you, because there's so many stressors and so many different things, what type of, um, advice, I guess, would you have for those people who are going through it in that situation, finding out new things that they may not have known, or maybe like you said, those things is like, well, I thought you was this, but now, mm -hmm." like, what is some advice for them that you have? One of the things we always say is you have to be intentional about this. You have to actually be intentional. If you want to, if you want something from your partner or you want to do something with your partner, your partner is maybe lacking in something or slacking in something. You want to bring it, you want to bring it to them, but your intention, what's your intention in bringing it to that person? Is your intention to make them feel bad, shame them into doing it? Or is your intention to try to encourage them to actually do the things that they used to do or be the person that you fell in love with, if you see what I'm saying? So yeah. if you're going to communicate with somebody, make sure you're communicating in an appropriate manner. Yeah. You know, make, make sure you're actually coming to them with more love than disappointment. Ooh. Because, I mean, that'll determine what kind of response you get. Will you get a defensive response or will you get a response of someone who wants to try to make things make make things right? And that's anything. If you don't have a good intention behind something, then you're not going to get good results. And I think that's just a big thing. Like you said, coming and saying like, hey, babe, like, you know, we're not, I don't know, being intimate or we're not, you know, spending as much time or you leave the toilet seat up or why are your clothes by the dirty clothes hamper? Like, you know, but just coming from a place of love and saying, listen, like, I don't want, I don't want this thing, this unknown unseen thing to tear us apart because at the very end of the day, like this, you, I chose you and you chose me. Your spouse, your, your spouse, the person you're interested in is probably going to change. Yeah. You know, they're, they're going to go through a couple of changes right now. Nothing is normal right now. Yeah, we we got to let's give a little bit of leeway. Things aren't normal right now, right? You know, great. Got it. <laughs> My favorite word, great. If we're at, hey, look, if we're asking landlords and mortgage companies for it, we can probably ask our partner for it too, just a little. I've literally spoke to a homegirl about this last week. To the single single people, put your phone down. People, oh, yeah, look, when you have all this time to think, you're going to seek a distraction. You're going to end up texting someone you either don't want to text. You're going to send a message to somebody that you've been telling yourself you don't need to send a message to. Just put your phone down. I don't think if you are single, single, don't date right now. Just just be easy. Just wait till this is done. <laughs> just wait till this is done because this ain't the normal. So whatever you create right now, this ain't the normal right now. And to, to speak on that, Lord, they, they, they in the DMs and they in the messages and, and they, they're here. They are uh, bored. And I am politely telling them you're bored. And that's why you're texting and calling me because you're bored and I'm not a board game. So you are more than welcome to go play with somebody else's time, but but not mine. So, <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to remind people because, oh, Lord, that's that's a word because some people out here, you know, when you, you know, you get drunk and you call that ex, you don't mean to. That's how y'all acting sober right now. Okay. So cut it out, cut it out. Cause that is a word. And I will listen, transparency. Y'all know I like being transparent. When I first, when we first started this quarantine, Justin, I got on Bumble cause I was so bored. I was like, let me just talk to these fools. Let me tell you something. In the week that I had it, I had to block two people cause they were so psychotic. I said, see, this quarantine bringing out y'all crazy, or maybe y'all always been crazy. I don't know. Two is low. <laughs> That's because I got off there when I found the crazies. I said, oh no, this ain't it. This ain't it. Mm -mm. Nope. Y'all are insane, and I'm not interested because next thing y'all know, y'all gonna find out where I live. I'm good. 
<laughs> I'm good. But to go into that about the single people, because I've had conversations with friends who live by themselves and they're in this and not even just like with a spouse or like with a roommate. I have a roommate, so I'm fine. But people who live by themselves and they're like you said, having to kind of face those stressors and listen to themselves and look at themselves in the mirror and face themselves. How do you suggest, you know, for them in this space of being alone to kind of deal with that anxiety or grief that they're going through right now? One of the things I do in my practice and that I work on with every client I have is I work on them to build a healthy support network. Meaning that's a, that's a, that's a group of people that you can actually trust and you can actually bring things to. Mm. Um, many people will say they have friends. Many people will say they have, you know, a couple friends, associates, whatever it may be. But I recommend everyone find at least one, two or more if you can, but at least one person you can bring practically anything to that you could just have a conversation with. They don't even have to have a therapy-based conversation, just have a conversation with so you can talk to someone besides yourself about the things going on in your life. So for those people who are at home completely on their own, look, at this point now, we, we these phones run, what would you say? Anywhere from $700,000 phones? If FaceTime, Duo calls, Facebook message, call somebody, and just yeah. occasionally have a video chat. Yeah. Just get on video calls with people. It's just, yeah. it, it'll, it will, you'll be surprised of how much that will improve your mood. I love to see the people that are doing Zoom parties. Yeah, me and my family did a, a family happy hour the other day. It was so much fun. I love that. Because that's, that's what it takes. That, that, and that's a perfect way of being intentional about what it is you're trying to do. Don't fight. You know, we, we try to be real tough out here nowadays. Don't fight the feeling. <laughs> Don't fight if you feel lonely. Don't fight if you feel isolated. Inten be intentional about doing something about it. Yeah. I love that. I think that's really great because we had such a good time on that family happy hour. And it was with my cousins on my dad's side and my aunts. And we had so much fun. Just we were on the phone. I think our happy hour started at like 730 and we got off right before midnight. We had a ball just drinking, taking shots, just having fun. It's fun. And we were just like, oh, my God, we get out of this. We're going to do this. We're going to do a cabin trip. Like, it's so much fun. But I think that's so important to be able to call your support network and say, hey, y'all, I'm feeling really lonely right now or I'm feeling really down. And to be like, oh, girl, look, well, let's go, you know, let, let's have a happy hour. I keep talking about happy hour. Clearly I drink. So, like, you know, but just having those moments are, I, I talked to my girlfriend today and she said, yeah, you know, I feel like I just need a really good cry session. I said, well, if you ever need to call me to cry, I'm a, I'm a great I'm a great support crier because if you cry, I'm going to cry just off rip. So like, you don't have to cry alone. But it's the truth. Like just to be able to have that. Yeah. Just to be able to have that to say this is how I'm feeling. And it doesn't always have to be sad. You can be like, oh, I'm so angry that this COVID and did it. Listen, I get it. And Laura, and that's why so many and that's why so many people don't do it. They feel they feel that what they whatever they're dealing with is always so maybe it's so sad or so stressful and they don't want to bring their friends down. I tell them, look, guys, this is how you determine who's a good friend, you know, who's a great friend, who's a good friend, and who's just a friend. Who's in that inner, that inner circle, that middle circle, that outer circle. If you bring some, if you're dealing with something, you bring something to somebody and they're not, they're completely unavailable. Doesn't mean they're a bad person, just, okay, for the moment, let's put you in this circle. Do we mean emotionally unavailable or like physically like can't call? They may be emotionally yeah, they may be emotionally unavailable. Okay. Some people aren't good for dealing with certain things, and that's totally okay. Totally fine. Yeah, because I want to make sure I'm I'm not saying that people need to jump when you say jump in order to be a good friend to you. That's not even remotely what I'm saying. What I mean is you find out based upon people's responses where they should fit in your life by talking to people about it you end up creating and organizing your support network. <laughs> Look, a, good, a great friend will tell you, even if, if they're not emotionally available in that moment, because maybe they're going through something, you know, they'll, they'll tell you that they can't right now. They can't at this moment. That friend who's in your support network. Right. Or they'll say, hey, man, well, let's, 
let's, you know, let's talk about this at this time, or can I give you a call back at this time? You know, we'll rap about it or whatever it may be, but a good friend will show some interest, some care and let you know, Hey, you know, I'm there for you. The same way you offered, you offered your shoulder to your friend. Like I'm a good crier. So I wanted to really talk to you about this narrative. So I'm sure you've seen it. There's this narrative going around. Oh God, it's some meme. And it's like, if you aren't doing this, if you aren't doing that, you didn't lack time, you lack discipline. And listen, oh Lord, that, when I tell you that, I'm, tr- I be, I'm trying to do better and not cuss, but that really chapped my ass because Stop telling people what to do. Like, how do you feel about that narrative? And <laughs> no, no, I'm gonna let you go because I'm gonna I'll go on a rant. I'm gonna let you go, Justin. You the professional here. Because that I can't stand that narrative. I, I can't stand this desire that because people because of the pandemic outside and people are spending more time indoors, ignore the anxiety of everything that's happening outside. You should be building your lifelong business. What, what kind of shaming type behavior is that? So then if someone, yeah, if someone doesn't do it, oh, that means they failed or they're not as, they're not as driven of a person or whatever. Don't, don't do that. That's just a, that whole narrative is a way for people to continue to compete against one another. When in reality, we really kind of need to cooperate more. I mean, do we see the state of the world that we're in right now? Like cooperation would go a much longer way than competition. That's yeah, That's like real. don't. I, well, what are they? What's, what's the? I saw someone. I saw someone one time call it LLC Twitter, and I busted out laughing because I swear that's what it is. It's just a bunch of quote unquote business owners telling people how they should start a business too and be a business owner like them. Yes, if you want to be productive, that's great. And if you want to sit home all day and do nothing, that's great too. If you don't feel motivated one day, that's cool. If you clean your whole house in one day, that's awesome. Let people just be. You don't have to start a business throughout this whole thing, guys. If you, especially if you work a lot and you have a pretty hectic life on a regular basis, Take this time to do nothing. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything for anybody's satisfaction, but for your own. And we'll and, and, and we'll talk about that when I get to these these comments that are on Instagram, because, you know, I'll get to it. I'm not going to dive too much into it, but that is so real. You don't have to you don't have to do anything for anybody. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. Like I'm a firm believer in doing you and in marching to the beat of your own drum. I march to the beat of my own drum. I always have. And some days I'm like super productive and I'm like, yeah, I did this. And then some days I don't do anything and I don't feel bad about it at all. And it may be two, three days in a row. It may be a week that I don't do anything. You don't have to. You, you don't have to do it. You, you don't have to write your business plan down today. You, you don't. Take yeah. your time and move at a pace that's comfortable for you. Right now, yeah. self-care is the most important thing. I love that. So, but I'm going to be nice and I'm going to play devil's advocate for those people who feel like, you know, well, I am being productive and I'm doing all these things. Like, I feel like I can't, you know, say anything because people are going to think I'm shaming them or I'm just telling you that, you know, this is a good time to start that book club or to start that business or to whatever it is. And they feel like they're getting shamed for, being productive and taking advantage of this time. How do you kind of talk to those people to say, it's okay, like, but maybe there's a way to go about it. I think you just hit the nail on the head. And that's, that's, um, that's a great way. That's a great point to add clarification. We're not saying that anybody who makes a product, makes a production type of status or is talking to folks about, this is an opportunity to do that thing you've always wanted to do. We're not saying that, you know, they're shaming people, not at all. We're talking about the people that come on and say, if you aren't doing this, then you're this kind of person. Mm, For those that actually, for many people who are starting things now, because they say, you know what, they realize they have the time and they're going to try to get into it. Great. That's just as great as a person that doesn't have a lot of time finally has time and wants to spend that time resting. Um, yeah, that's Both right. of them are perfectly fine. One doesn't have to be wrong. I think we do enough of that in our society now where if it's not the same thing I'm doing, it must be wrong. It's perfectly fine to have multiple right answers. 
And you'll notice that for the people that for the people that are being productive now, or for the people who talk about product productivity, the ones that are doing it in a healthy in a healthy manner and a way that's not shaming are talking to people who have expressed that they want to try to do something. They've expressed that, you know, I really want to try to get back into taking photos. I really want to get back into, you know, podcasting, whatever it is they wanted to do, then sure, this is an opportunity for them. So no, they don't, there is a, but you hit the nail on the head, Lauren, there's a way to go about encouraging people to do the things that they want to do. So a question that I really wanted to, and again, maybe I'm talking to myself, is there any techniques um, to bring yourself back from those moments when you're having anxiety or when you're having panic during this time that you would love to share with us? Anxiety affects many people in a lot of different ways. But one of the things about anxiety is anxiety a lot of times is rooted in a little bit of truth and a lot of fiction. Our anxiety may be may be based around a truthful situation, and we have a million outcomes in our mind about the situation that may not be rooted in fact. You see what I mean? And what happens is when a person is really, really kind of lost in their anxiety, they're thinking about a million, they're so worried, they're thinking about a million things that may not even be true or may not even be possible. But they're lost, I guess you could say they're lost in the sauce at that moment, you know? Right. So one of the big one of the big things I'm going to I will say advice for that goes leads back to something that we talked about already. And it's that support network. When you're starting to feel anxious, I would always recommend people reach out to somebody that you care about and someone that cares about you. Just reach out to them and just talk to them a little bit about what you're anxious about. Those close people will tell you whether it's rooted in reality or whether it's not. They're not going to use those exact words and, unless they're probably just themselves. Um, but they will tell you, they'll come along the lines and say, man, that man, that don't even make sense. That don't even seem right. Or girl, that don't even make sense. Or even if they can't calm you down, what they can also do is help you take some time during that moment. One of the things about panic attacks and anxiety is that it's really draining on the person. Yes, it is. And after a while, after you've been drained for a while, the energy is going. You legit just can't keep feeding the anxiety and the panic. So one thing that people can do in that moment is when you really start to feel that heart start to race is you can just stop what you're doing, take multiple deep breaths, five seconds in, five seconds out, and just count slowly. Just count slowly, high as you can. Some people go to 10, some people go to 50 even. But what that does, it just slows you down and it allows just a little bit of time to pass. Something I tell a lot of my clients, Something I tell a lot of my clients, Lauren, is I give them a bit of a hypothetical situation. A lot of times when we're worried about things and anxiety, and we're worried about it, and we have an anxious situation, we probably have, let's just say, 10 outcomes of how it's going to work out, of how it's going to work out, right? And I, I like to ask my clients, of those 10 things, about how many do you think could possibly happen? Like, how many do you think could realistically happen if you really sit down and think about it? Maybe three, four. The other six are generally so far-fetched, that's not really happening. Yeah. Out of those three or four, only maybe one, if that high, maybe one will happen regardless. There's nothing you could do. That one may actually happen. The other three, we could potentially make happen through our consistent involvement and by what's known as anxious behavior. Hmm. Okay. Anxious behavior, the easiest way to just explain that is overcompensation. You ever known somebody to think you were angry at them before? Yes, absolutely. And when that, and at the time, Lauren, you probably weren't even angry at them, were you? No, not at all. But that person kept thinking that you were. So they either kept mentioning, why are you so angry? Why are you so angry? Why are you so angry? Over time, what, what would happen? I would get irritated and mad <laughs> that you keep asking me or that person would start to treat you as if you're angry at them mm. which would probably come off a little cold probably come off a little distant next thing you know you're probably a little cold and distant toward them yeah and then when that has happened in the past have you ever sat has that person ever sat back and said i knew you were mad at me yeah <laughs> 
This is what I'm talking about. I knew it. Completely missing the fact of how their behavior played into it. Mm. So their behavior created this, this kind of anger that was not there and it's now there. Right. So that's why both of the, both of the pieces of advice I gave between the, the counting method or talking to someone, reaching out to a very close person and talking through your anxiety. The first thing, one of the things that gives you is that time to slow down. Yeah. And then when you talk to somebody, talking through it with somebody helps you get rid of those things that couldn't happen anyways. You get rid of all those things that you're already, that you're, that are up there in your head, but can't be centered in reality. That's good, Justin. Justin's professional, y'all. Okay, because I don't know what I would have told y'all because I, I shared at the beginning of this episode that I had a anxiety attack that woke me up at 3.30 in the morning. And, and you know, I thought I was... <laughs> Thought I had caught that Corona it got me. I was like, Corona, you got me, girl. Like, I just knew that it got me. But the beautiful thing that came from it was this podcast. So I feel like at that moment, God was like, go write in your journal. And I literally just started writing all this stuff in my journal about this podcast. So that, but I did do the breathing and all those things because I have been to therapy myself. So like I, I did the breathing and allowed, like you said, some time. And I feel like that time allowed that, that peace and that openness to come to be able to hear God to write in this notebook. So I think those are some really, really great techniques. And I hope that you all write those down. And when you're in those moments, especially again, right now with, you know, COVID and all this stuff, because we all know we wake up in the morning, our throat itch and it's like, <clears throat> you start taking your temperature, you looking around, you like, okay, hold on. Okay. Calm down. You, you, you freak yourself out so much more. Now you're wondering why you got a shortness of breath and you hyperventilating because you freaked yourself out even more and talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> that's it seriously but i think that's so, that time i mean the way you that time just time and support is what we all need right now i don't care if you think you on cloud nine and you all your business is popping you still need time and you still need that support in this time because if you for some reason think you got covid i guarantee all that stuff will go to the wayside and you will have a full-blown meltdown I asked my followers on Instagram, you know, what were their thoughts? Like, what are their real thoughts about the whole situation? Are they feeling uneasy? You know, and where do we kind of go from here? So I had really a mixture. I had some people saying, you know, they're over it, but they're just grateful that, you know, God's still providing and they're good. So I think that's awesome. You know, I totally feel the same, but I had some people saying they kind of have mixed feelings about it. So like you said, people are spending more time with their family and, you know, we're, we're doing happy hours and they're at home spending time with their kids and seeing them growing up. But then you, you know, this particular, um, person is a, a teacher. And so she was saying, you know, she's missing her. And I'm sure your wife is missing her kids and you're not going to get to see them anymore because now you're going to have a new class. And so she's having this battle of like, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be spending time with my, my family and my daughter and my husband, but I also really miss my kids. So I don't want to say she's going through her guilt because she didn't say that. So I don't want to put that in her, but you, and, and you know, how do you kind of combat that feeling? Like, I, you know, I, I can't imagine, especially being a teacher, you have these kids and you're pouring into them and now you don't get to see them next year. Like, how do you even how, how do you even deal with that? Teachers, teachers, you all are doing the best you all can in this whole situation. Um, it has not been fair to you all. Um, it has not been fair at all to expect teachers to be able to continue to perform their job in a variety of environments uh, like their homes is difficult. We can all, you know, the school, the school system is, the school system offers, let's say, equal footing. Every teacher, you have your classroom, the students are there. It's kind of a standardized environment. Your home situation may be totally different. You may have kids of your own. You may not have internet that allows you to do whatever it is the school is requiring you to still do. What I'm seeing teachers do blows my mind. Um, yeah. And then what I'm seeing that's expected of teachers throughout this, this is it's insane. Um, so I could only imagine <laughs> what, she's, what she's experiencing. 
And I could, I definitely say she's totally entitled to miss the kids. Good teachers build relationships with their students. And so to suddenly, suddenly have that relationship taken away from you like that, and especially if she, especially if she dealt with seniors, you know, these kids aren't even going to be in the school next year where they can come to your room and just say, hey, these kids may be in a whole different school, a whole different state afterwards. That's tough. It, it goes back to the first thing that you the first thing that you brought up when we started talking, Lauren. That's how some people could start to feel that grief. And I would imagine that what she's feeling is that same type of grief. I would hope that there's no guilt there at all. Unfortunately, there's very little that you can do in this moment. Um, I see some teachers are being real creative in regards to driving by the kids' homes, honking from outside, you know, seeing them from six feet away, whatever they can, uh, if that's an option for her. Some yeah. teachers have really gotten some joy out of that. Um, I'll share something that uh, I'll share something that my wife and one of the other teachers did because I thought that was actually kind of I thought that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. They both, her and another teacher, created a second Instagram account for themselves as teachers okay. uh, separate from their personal account. And they invited all their kids to befriend that account. Oh. And they had an Instagram and early on in quarantine, they had an Instagram live where they would offer tutorial, where they would help with any questions that the kids had for some of the work that they still had. And um, I know she's brought to me that they want to do another one going into May checking up on everything that the kids have been doing and just kind of keeping up with them. Oh, that's so good. You know, so I don't know if that's something that that teacher or other teachers feel comfortable or be willing to do. Again, it wasn't their personal accounts. Right. It was, um, it was a secondary account of them, you know, strictly in teacher mode, nothing personal mm -hmm. on there. And they, um, they befriended the kids on there and would just host a live, giving the kids an opportunity to talk to them um, some teachers I know are doing Zoom calls because essentially for many teachers, the kids that you get along with, <laughs> build that relationship with, <laughs> right. um, they're like little family members. Yeah. You know, I've, I've had a couple, I've had some um, come by our house, some yeah. of my wife's teachers, you know, some of the wife's uh, teachers and students have come by the house before, you know, just to say, hey. I like your literal kids. <laughs> I like your kids. You spend so much time with them, you know, throughout the year and then, you know, they they go into their next year. And, and if, like you said, they're seniors, they go off to college and but you've spent all this time with them. So I, you know, I told her, I think super, teachers are superheroes and I think they should make if if this hasn't shown anything that teachers need to make more money, then I, that will be a protest I'll be out there for. OK, make, give them more money. Yes, that, that woman doesn't need a haircut. Uh, the teacher needs to be paid more. Oh, that's it. That's that's it. That's exactly what they need. I love it. So another comment or a couple these. This is actually a couple people that kind of talked about how. <laughs> and it was funny. It's not funny, but it is funny how we pressure ourselves. And I wonder where we get this pressure from, because a couple of people were talking about how they feel like they really should be embracing this slowdown in this moment. But then they feel pressured to be doing something or if they're not doing something, then they're wasting their time or they, they, they should be productive and they should have done this. And it's like, OK. So I wonder, so this may be a two-part question is where do you think that pressure comes from and why do we continue to put this pressure on ourselves? The pressure, unfortunately, comes from society as a whole. More specifically, I believe a lot of it comes from our online society and mm -hmm. we're, we're interacting with the online society a lot more than the face-to-face -face society due to the times that we're currently living in. And all you're going to see in the online society is people reaching great heights, people doing all kinds of things, because the only thing that the only thing that many of us put online are our representatives. So when you when you decide you got some time throughout the day and you decide to kill 20, 30 minutes um, on Twitter, Facebook, whatever your network may be of choice, you're going to see a lot of people saying that they're doing a lot of things. And our society is so competitive that it'll cause you to think that if I'm not doing those same things or if I'm not doing something as well, you'll think of all kinds of names to call yourself. Mm. So that society is coming from, unfortunately, it's coming from us. 
And God, I wish it, I wish it didn't. Yeah, same. I wish, I truly wish it wasn't there. The best way that I think to combat that is to really, really unplug if you can sometimes or have something in reality to kind of keep you grounded so you don't lose yourself in the, in the digital world, mm-hmm. social media and all the different comparisons that exist on there. But if you do have, but if, if you don't have that, I am one that is a big fan of curating your social media feed. It doesn't have to be an echo chamber of people that think exactly like you, Mm -hmm. but you can really start to reduce the amount of negativity and comparisons that you see on there. My friend said she did that today. She went through and like just cleaned up her social media. (laughs) Lauren, I'm telling you, I have, I have unfollowed people who I have no problem with. They're just the type that, that will, post their relationship and love using tags such as my such and such is better than yours. All right. I'm done with you. All right. You know, there's all kinds of extra. It, be, it happens. So people do it so much and probably don't even realize it. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with being happy about what you have or what you're doing, but make, let's make sure that we're not shaming someone else for not having it or not doing it. That's right. That's right. It's like, that's great. I'm so happy for you. But what you're doing is not better than anyone else. It may be, but you don't have to be like, this is better than yours. It's fine, guys. We we know. We know you're excellent in what you do. We know your relationship is perfect because all relationships are perfect, right? Duh. Um, And the last comment that I got, well, that I'll, you know, uh, we'll discuss is, The people who are up and down, that they're trying to figure out this balance and they're trying not to get overwhelmed and they're trying not to watch the news. But then you're like, well, let me just get on and see. And then you get that one article and it's talking about, well, these are the new symptoms. And I'm like, oh, oh gosh. All right now. And maybe this goes back to those techniques that you're talking about. Like, how do you combat that up and down feeling? Or do you just kind of let yourself go through those feelings and, you know, just let it ride? Depends on the effect that the feeling is starting to have on you. Oh, that's good. Some days, like like you and I both said, some days we're more motivated, and those are the days I probably plow through some work, get a lot of stuff done, and others and other days not so much. Both of those days are fine, but we both know that if we decided for the entire time of the quarantine that we were going to do absolutely no work, well, certain responsibilities would probably fall by the wayside. So there's there's going to be some variability. There's going to be some fluctuation in your motivation to get things done. That's okay. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be gung-ho every day. Nobody is. Even the ones that say they are, they're lying. They're not. I promise you, they're not. Um, you know, it's, it's totally okay to experience waves of motivation. Just understand that when you're not that motivated, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean you're being lazy. It doesn't mean... <laughs> Doesn't mean it definitely doesn't mean you're a failure. A question a lot of people don't really like to ask sometimes is why? Why do you feel like you have to get this done? Mm. Why do you feel like if you don't get it done, it's a negative thing? Why do you feel this way? And if when they answer that, I would ask them again, well, why is that? They would probably get a little upset at me over time. What we're getting to is the root reason as to why you feel that you must be moving all the time. Because mm-hmm. in my mind, that tells me you're either running from something. Is it either you're either running from failure or a feeling of failure or you're scared or there's definitely some severe anxiety somewhere or you're comparing yourself to something. Mm-hmm. You're dealing with perfectionism, whatever it may be. Mm-hmm. There's something else going on underneath. And the symptom is feeling as if you have to get this stuff done. You have to do these things. But I would challenge them and say, you're scared to fail for some reason. And I don't, you haven't really understood why. Mm, Listen, Justin's over here dropping bombs. Dropping bombs. Justin, this interview has been amazing. I, I can't say thank you enough because I don't even think you understand how much this is going to bless people who are going through something or who don't even, they're going through something. They're like, well, I'm not going through anything. But then they listen to what you're saying. and They're like, maybe I am, (laughs) you know, 
you are not alone okay we are all out here in this this weird feeling of the unknown because nobody we just don't know we don't know what the future holds we don't know we're kind of trying to adjust to this new normal we don't know it's man it's just a new way of life and i think the same thing happened after 9 11 you know there was it, things weren't normal you know, as far as travel and the travel industry, things weren't normal. And I think that's kind of the, what we're doing is you adjust just like in grief. I tell people all the time, you adjust, it doesn't get easy. You just adjust, you focus on that adjustment. And that's what seems to make it easy because you focus on that adjustment. And so I just wanted to thank you so much for being here. Well, being on the phone, you know, and since we can't be in person, but and just taking some time out of your day to just help people, man. And and shout out to you for deciding your passion for people and discovering and, and channeling it into help. So I truly, truly appreciate you. So if you can tell the people where they can find you, where they can reach you, if they have any more questions, if they want you to be their counselor, like where can they find you? <laughs> Look, asking for myself. On social media, guys, the easiest way to find me is on my own, is on my Instagram page. Uh, you can find me at Justin De- Justin DeBowles LPC on Instagram. Uh, that's J-U-S-T-E-N-D-E-B-O-W-L-E-S-L-P-C. That's at Instagram. That's also my website, justinthebowlslpc.com. On there, I can be contacted. My phone number's on there, uh, as well with links to the Instagram, links to the Facebook. Fastest way to get in touch with me and see what I and to get an idea of what I do to reach out if you want counseling or if you just want to talk some more, guys. It's not a problem at all. You listen, he is a gem. I just want y'all to know, like, we just met and he is a gem. So y'all hit him up. I always tell people to go to therapy. So like you have a therapist, we shared, I shared with you how I love that you're a male therapist because I feel like people don't hear from you guys enough. And so I'm just so honored and humbled that you're here. So thank you so, so much for your time. This is great. I'm so excited. I'm trying to calm down. I get really excited, (laughs) y'all. Give you this. I'll give you this before you go. There's another Instagram page I definitely want to let people know about. Um, about, I want to say a couple of months ago, a bunch of black males that provide therapy in Atlanta all decided to find one another. And it is the, and we established kind of a, I'm, when I say an organization, let's just say it's a group right now. It's a group of us. And we all just make sure we stay in touch and work with one another. And it's called the Counseling Brothers of Atlanta. I love it. And you said that's on Instagram? It's on Instagram. The Instagram handle is the C-B-O-A-T-L. The C-B-O-A-T-L. There are, because there's so few African-American male counselors, that especially that people can reach easily, we're trying to get more out there. Yeah. So if you, you know, if you're looking for a male counselor, uh, especially, if, especially African-American male, I will, I'd love to have you all come see me, but if I'm not available or I don't take the insurance that you all do, or you want to use your insurance, there's, there are other black male counselors out there and that's an easy way to reach them. Love it. Oh my gosh. I love it. I'm so excited. That's so awesome. Shout out to y'all, man. Just out here doing it. Man, people be out here doing it. Y'all out here doing it. I'm so sorry. I just got, I just got, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, y'all out here doing it. I love it. Well, I won't take up the rest of your day, but thank you, Justin, for being here again. And I'm going to get into my wrap up, but thank you so much. You gave me so many good points to wrap up on. I appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. No, thank you so much for having me. Um, I've had a fantastic time getting a chance <laughs> to talk to you. That was so good. Oh my goodness. And I know I say that all the time, but honestly, that was so great. And I think I needed that. (laughs) I needed to hear all of those things. And I think he gave so many great points and tips to everyone. If you're at home by yourself, if you're in a relationship, if you're not in a relationship, if you are being productive, if you're not being productive, if you're feeling away, if you're not feeling away. He gave so many great tips and jewels, and I hope that you all appreciated that as much as I did. So, of course, I'd love to leave you all with some points that I took away from the episode. And so the one of the points 
not the major point, but one of the points that I took away was taking the time. And so when you're going through those moments that you're kind of having anxiety or maybe a little bit of panic or worry is making sure to take the time. And so some of the techniques that he was talking about was doing that breathing in for five and breathing out for five and counting to as high as you can to bring yourself back down to that calm place because you're letting that time pass. And this is, I guess this is kind of twofold is creating that support network so that when you do or you are feeling some type of way that you can call that support network and they can help you kind of bring you back to say, well, is that really going to happen? Is that realistic? Let's walk through it. Really creating that support network. And one of the things that has worked for me, a technique that I work, that I learned in therapy is called the 54321 method. So what it is, is that when you feel yourself kind of getting anxious or panicked or uneasy, you do the you count from five, four, three, two, one. So you look for five things that you can see. You um, look for four things, or you touch four things. You hear three things. You smell two things, and you taste one thing. So you look for you can see five things. You touch. You you think about four things you can touch. You think about three things you can hear. You think about two things you can smell and you think about one thing you can taste. And by the time you get to one, you brought yourself back and centered to that calm place. And that's worked a lot for me if I do kind of go in those anxious and weird places. Another point is to appreciate and respect wherever you're at. And so if you, again, are are unmotivated or you don't feel like doing anything or you work so hard all the time and right now you are taking the time to not do anything, appreciate and respect that. And that's fine. You don't have to feel that pressure of society. You don't have to to do things just because they say that you don't have any discipline. That's not true. You appreciate and respect where you're at for your own mental health. Because what's important is your mental health. Nobody else can tell you about you and your mental. So you have to appreciate and respect wherever you are at in the process. And my last point is to give yourself and others grace during this time, especially if you're in a relationship and you all are, you know, constantly around each other now, is to have that understanding and give each other grace and everybody needs time. So give yourself grace to not do anything, to be productive, to make mistakes and to make a meal that sucks. It, it, again, talking to myself, I let me just say, I am a great cook, but I have made some meals that are not that great. Even though other people are like, they're good. I don't think they're great. But I give myself grace and say, okay, well, this is what you did this time. This is what you'll do better next time. But give yourself just some grace during this time of like, God, I didn't do anything today. I was like a slob. You're not a slob. You just didn't feel like doing anything. And that's okay. It's totally fine. Give yourself grace. As I always say, be kind to yourself. And that is what's going to help us all get through this weird moment of uncertainty, of having that weird anticipatory, anticipatory, excuse me, grief that I was telling you guys about. But just, just guys, just take the time to get through, create that support network, appreciate and respect wherever you're at and respect others as well and give yourself and others grace during this time. And I think we all can get through this. We're all connected in this time as a human connection. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, orange, yellow, blue. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. We're all connected. We're all connected in that spirit of unknowingness, in that that anticipatory grief. We're all connected in that sense, you guys. So if we can all just give each other grace and be kind and create these places and safe spaces for ourselves, we're going to come out of this on the other side, just like you do with grief. And it's going to be so beautiful and it's going to be so much better than being in the thick of it. So that is it, you guys. Thank you so much for listening to another week's episode of This Too Shall Suck podcast, where we talk about the real of grief, the whole grief, and nothing but the grief. This episode was produced by Mike Sick, and our original music is produced by Jimmy Samaj. 
You guys can follow me on social media on Instagram at TTSS pod and make sure that you drop comments and let me know how you liked it. And I, I ask these questions all the time. And as you see that we kind of went through them so I can know your thoughts. And I really do like to talk about them and I want to help in any way that I can. So make sure you guys are following me there. And you can also visit my website at this two shall suck podcast.com. And also feel free to drop me a line about any questions or any topics you want to hear. Or if you just want to say what's up with you don't have Instagram, feel free to send me an email at hello at this two shall suck podcast.com. Wherever you're listening, please remember to rate, review, and subscribe and share this podcast with someone you think it could help. As always, I love you guys and I'm sending you love and light in your life because you deserve it. I'll see you on the next episode. Mwah.